Good morning and welcome to Forest Hill. We are so glad that you are here to join us this morning in worship and we're glad that you're joining us online as well this morning. Um, we have a charge conference coming up on June the 28th, which is very Methodist of it of us. It is when we gather together to do the work of the church. And the charge conference is specifically to accept the paperwork for our incoming associate, Wes Judy. Wes's first Sunday will be um, the 11th of July, and our charge conference will be June the 28th at 7 p.m. If you need more information about that, please contact the church office. We are also really excited that things are starting back again and we are able to be with one another. And one of the ways that we are um, continuing to support our church family is through caregivers. Caregivers check on our homebound members and uh, remind them that we love them, pray with them, um, and keep them connected to the church. And if anybody would like to join the caregivers team, uh, we're getting that cranked back up. You can see Nurse Angie or call the church office and we will get you connected. We would love for you to come out and be part of this very special ministry. Uh, when you are part of caregivers, you get as much as you give. And so it's a wonderful opportunity um, to be in ministry with one another. So with all of that, let's center ourselves um, in prayer as we go to God. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for this time of worship, and we ask that you would impart upon us your Holy Spirit, that you would fill us up, that you would calm our hearts and our minds as we come before you in worship, Lord. We give you all of who we are and all that we have to honor you in this time. All this we lift and pray in your holy name. Amen. Would you please stand and join us as we sing Rise.
God, we come before you this morning. We come here with so much going on in our world, so many different things, coming from all different walks of life, coming from all different places. And Lord, we just want to be with you. We just want to worship you this morning, God, because even in the hurt, even in the confusion, even in those tough times, Lord, we know that we don't have to be afraid, that you stand with us, that you love us, God. We just lift that up this morning. We praise you. scripture this morning comes from John 15 verses 12 and 13. This is my commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to give up one's life for one's friends. I read a news article this week um, about Bryson Kilman. He's eight years old and he loves Pokemon cards. Since he was four years old, that's what he's asked for for every birthday and every Christmas, Pokemon cards. He also really wanted a new puppy. And so for years, he would ask his mom to get him a puppy. And um, this earlier this spring, a friend of their family had a litter of puppies and he got Bruce and fell in love with Bruce. 
Bruce and Bryson were inseparable. They did everything together, and he said, he is my best friend. A few months after they got Bruce, they realized that he had parvo, and the family did not have the money it was going to require for um, the treatment. And so as soon as Bryson found out, he began to devise a plan. And he set up a stand in his yard, and he put all of his Pokemon cards out there, his prized possession, and he began to sell them because he said, I'll do anything to save my best friend's life. The neighborhood, of course, um, stepped in to buy his Pokemon cards, even though they were not Pokemon card collectors, and a GoFundMe page was um, set up, and people across the country helped to treat this puppy, and he was made well. But it was because of the love that they shared that Bryce was willing to do whatever he could to save another's life. We don't often think about the generosity and where it comes from in our life, but it truly comes out of our love. Our love is the thing that moves us, that changes us, that makes us generous people to give our most valued possessions to share our love. Jesus came into the world to give his very life, to show us love, to give us grace, and to show us God's love for us. And we come to this time and this space and we acknowledge that we love God. And out of that love, that deep love that we have experienced and we now have, we become generous people. We lay down the things that are important to us to show God how much we are loved, to show God how much we love God and how blessed we are. So as we come and think about what we give, may we give with grateful and generous hearts. May we give out of the immense love that God has placed in our hearts. May we give our sacrifices of offering and worship and praise. We also come to this space um, with people on our hearts and heavy things in our lives that we offer up to God. So I want to share a few prayer concerns with you. Dory Thurman lost her brother Jerry this week. Um, we pray for Nidra Bryant and Nidra's family as they prepare for the memorial service on Saturday for her sister to Cedal. Um, we pray for Lindsay Kozaki's family as they too prepare for her memorial service on Saturday. Um, we celebrate that we have Vic with us this morning. Um, Vic has done marvelous with his kidney uh, transplant. We just celebrate uh, a new lease on life, and so we're happy that he is present with us in worship this morning. We also celebrate um, that we had a fantastic turnout with our senior adults and they had wonderful fellowship and have a great plan for moving forward and that just felt like a breath of fresh air um, that we all sat around tables and ate ice cream without mask on. It was phenomenal. We now give thanks for the little joys in life that we never thought we would be thankful for but truly warm our hearts. Um, so it is with these things that we go to God in prayer. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks that you meet us where you are, that you love us as we are, that you um, come to us in the times of sorrow and grief and you wrap your arms around us and you help us to feel your presence. We thank you for celebrations, for new leases on life. We thank you for life that continues in the midst of sadness. And we thank you for deep joy and abiding love. Lord, we ask that you would continue to bless us, that you would continue to bless our church, that you would help us to be bold and prophetic witnesses in the world, that we can be a place that shines your love, your light, your joy, and your grace in all the things that we do. All this we offer to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
what today's lesson will be about. Today's lesson is going to be about emotions. Now we all start with a primary set, and as we grow older, we acquire more of them. When your emotions control your action, it affects not only yourself, but the people around you. This will help to down. Emotions are centered in the lower part of the brain. It is complicated, yes, but mysterious no longer. Emotional behavior is largely involuntary. <laughs> I can't believe that. 
We have certain basic emotions which are controlled subconsciously. Notice your own emotional reactions. What did you feel? What did you do? Under control, your emotions can make you healthier and happier and improve the lives of people around you. This is pretty clever. That's a rather simplified suggestion of a complex mental process. But you get the idea. So our sermon series is on emotions. And when I planned this several months ago, I did not know how timely this sermon would be for many of us in this congregation. It's a sermon about grief. So let us hear now the words of the scripture from Psalm 34, verses 17 through 18. When the righteous cry out, the Lord listens. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those whose spirits are crushed. Holy Lord, we give you thanks for this, your word. And Lord, we ask now that you would open our hearts to your message and your healing spirit within us in these moments. In your name we pray, amen. I did not grow up knowing how to deal with grief. When I was a child, my grandfather died when I was five. A grandmother figure to me that I was very close to died when I was eight. When I was a young adult, one of my grandmothers passed away. And all of those were sad losses, but in many ways they were expected. And I dealt with them like we deal with losses that are expected. I was sad, but I was not crushed. I was not terribly brokenhearted. I understood that death was a part of life. It was not until my nine-month-year-old niece died that I truly experienced the depths of grief. I grieved my loss. I grieved my sister's loss. I grieved the loss of our family. It felt like everybody was grieving so deeply. We felt helpless, and it was more than we could bear. Almost. Except I did these things to help myself cope because I didn't have good skills. I took care of other people. I worked to be strong. I had little kids, and so I knew that I had to just keep going. I had to make everything seem as normal as possible, and I stayed busy with life. But as you might expect, ultimately that did not go very well for me. Three months into the idea of suppressing my grief, it all came rushing in, without warning and without my ability to control it. It was then... I had no choice but to deal with my grief. With grief, I learned there are no shortcuts or ways around it. There is only a way through it. Grief is the sorrow that we feel in times of loss. We most often think about it when we lose someone we love. But grief comes at other times in our life, other losses. When we lose our pets, our jobs, our relationships. Times when we move when we lose sentimental items or traditions. We grieve in times of transition, even if they are wanted and needed. Grief originates from any loss, and grief has the ability to compound. When one grief comes on top of another grief, it becomes more than we can bear at times. In the past year and a half, we have had communal grief. We have all lost things we did not want to lose. It has been different for each of us, but I have seen that we have all experienced grief, which means that any loss that we have experienced personally in the last year and a half has been compounded by the grief that we have felt as a society. We have not been able to recover from this grief that we have experienced together, and we are tired We are not at our best, and our emotional health has been compromised. And in that, we are experiencing a wide range of emotions, because grief is not a single emotion. It is entanglement of emotions. When I began the process of grieving my niece, I went to Grief Share. It's a support group. And they have this image that has been ingrained in my mind since I first saw it. 
It was liberating to me to see this image of a ball of emotions that, com that comprised grief. I know you can't see all the details of this um, picture, but we'll put it out on the email. But basically, it is grief as a ball, and it shows all the wide range of emotions that are tangled up in that. And when we get tangled up in all those emotions of grief, it is hard to sort out, and it is intense. And just seeing this picture at that time in my life helped me to understand how hard grief is to manage. Grief is a gift. In the moment of loss, grief does not feel like a gift at all. But ultimately, it is a gift, a way of healing. Love, pain can only go where love has already been. So in that grieving, we know the depths of the love that we have for the person or thing that we have lost. Remembering the love and goodness of what we have lost helps us move through the sorrow. Sharing stories with others, holding on to items that remind us of what we have lost, or praying through our sadness and loss are ways in which we honor our memories. Oftentimes we get nervous in the midst of grief. We think we just have to hold on so tightly because we might forget. What if we forget these beautiful memories? What if we forget the depth of emotion that we have in this very moment? And so there is a goodness of journaling in grief, writing down those memories and feelings so that we can release that anxiety of having to hold on and know that it is safe on pieces of paper that remind us that we don't have to be nervous about forgetting. Grief, it takes time. A few weeks ago when I first talked about emotions, I talked about that emotions have physiological responses and grief is no exception to that rule. It changes our bodies and our minds. Grief is overwhelming and the symptoms of grief play out in our life. Shock and disbelief, Inability to focus on task at, hands, at hand, a foggy mind, lack of desire to engage with others, inability to control our emotions, and fatigue. As we embrace this journey and we are kind to ourselves, these symptoms of grief improve. But it's important to understand that everybody's grief journey is different. Even the ways in which we grieve at different times in our life are different and it's okay to be kind to ourselves and to seek help along the journey. Many people realize that they need help immediately after a loss and seek out grief counseling. Sometimes we get further in the process and we realize that we're stuck and we're not able to continue life as we once did and we reach out for counseling then. Hospice is an amazing place to find resources for grief counseling. If you are struggling with symptoms of grief that are affecting your daily life after six months, you should strongly consider someone helping you along the path because these things take time and sometimes we need people to go along with us along the path. The Gospel of Luke reminds us that in time healing will come and we will find joy again. Luke 6.21 says, Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep for now, for you shall laugh. This morning's scripture is another reminder that God is with us. It said, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. The theme of God's abiding presence can be seen over and over in the scripture and in times of grief we cling to those places that remind us that God is with us. Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is wherever you go. In the sadness and the grief and the joy and the laughter, God is there wherever we go. God is faithful to be with us. That doesn't mean we will not feel alone, but it does mean that even when we feel alone, God is there. And there will come a day when we will no longer feel the pain of grief, and there will be no more pain, no more mourning or crying. 
Revelation 21 4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Until that day, we live in the promises of God and seek God in the sorrow. When I was in the throes of grief, I realized that I wanted to pray. I wanted this connection to God. I wanted God's presence surrounding me, and yet I didn't have any words. I didn't know what to pray because all the things I wanted could not be made on this side of eternity. I didn't know how to go before God with all of my sorrow, my anger, my frustration, and so I began to pray the Psalms. For me, Psalm 77 was the Psalm that I prayed. I prayed it so much because I just didn't have my own words to take before God. And it's a psalm of lament. It speaks to the loneliness of the human experience, the depths for which we cry out to God and say, God, where are you? But it doesn't end there. It ends in this place of remembering. It, rem it ends in this place of the psalmist saying, I remember the goodness that you have done. I remember the goodness you have done in my life, in the life of your people, and I will hold tight to that. It doesn't end in a place of saying, oh, thank you, God, I now feel you, you're here. It ends in a place of loneliness, acknowledging that even in the loneliness, that they are not alone. It was powerful to me because it taught me to remember the ways that God has been good and faithful to me. It was a gift that carried me through to remember that God's presence was powerful in my life and that God was faithful and even in that moment of broken heartedness of sorrow that God was present even when I could not feel God's presence there are many psalms of lament that we can use to express our feelings when our words fail and they call us to remember the faithfulness of God even in our times of trial God also blesses us with the gift of community. God has created us to be communal people. And we find the hardest times in life we can find journey support along the journey with the people that God has gifted us with. In times of grief, we need one another. We need a hug. We need a kind word. We need a space to just be. Last week, I was listening to a podcast on grief, and there was a father who had lost his son. He was talking about his experience, and he said that he needed the gift of community. He needed people who had gone through what he went through just to show him that there was life on the other side. He said, I needed to know that somebody else who was just a few days ahead of me could get out of their bed and tie their shoes because that gave me hope. I needed to know that people were planning vacations and somebody had prepared a meal for their family because that gave me hope that I would get there too. He said, I needed this gift of community because it gave me hope and it let me heal just a little bit more. I have seen this play out time and time again in, in the church, in our church family and churches that I have served. It most, often help, it most often plays out when there is a widow whose husband has passed away, and you will see a group of ladies that will come and surround her. They will love her. They will care for her. They will pick her up to go to the movies and out to eat and show her what life looks like on the other side. And that is so important. It is a gift of our community to encourage people along the path. As a community, we can give this gift of allowing those to grieve, to share happy memories. Sometimes when we see somebody who has lost someone they love, we really want to shy away from talking about that. We want to find other things to talk about, but I learned something important about that when I was grieving and when I was seeing my sister grieve. When you are grieving, it's always on your mind. When you've lost somebody that you love deeply, it's there. It's there for a long time, and though you may be doing something else, it's in the back of your mind, and there are times that you want to acknowledge that. 
You want the people around you to acknowledge that, to create a space in which you can remember and celebrate the joy of the person that you have lost. As a community of faith, we can hold those spaces. We can allow people to be present, to share the gift of remembering people that they have loved and lost. We can sit in those places and we can laugh at those stories and it becomes a gift that we offer as a church community. In the church, we know that when we lose someone we love, that they have the gift of eternal life and we treasure that beyond measure. The gift of eternal life is the hope that keeps us going in this world, the uh, knowledge that in the end all will be made right, and we celebrate because we know that the person that we loved has gone on to eternal life. But there is this other piece of that. The other side of that coin is that we lost somebody that we love. We have an earthly void and it hurts. Our grief does not negate our hope in eternal life, nor does it make us less faithful. It is just part of who we are as humans. It is natural. It is a space for us to heal our broken hearts. And God meets us there in that space of heartbreak, in that place where we have lost something that we love, And God surrounds us with God's love and peace. It is not dependent on whether or not we feel it, but it is dependent on God who is faithful and always offers us that love and peace. So for all the places of sorrow that we hold, for all the losses that we have felt in this year, for all the families that we hold in our church family that are grieving this day, for those pieces of us which we feel once again deeply as we think about those that we have lost. We can offer them to God. We can sit in God's presence. And we can give thanks that pain and sorrow can only go where love has already gone. And we have been blessed to have love and sorrow. And through it all, God is present with us. Let us pray. Holy and loving Lord, we give you thanks that you love us so very much, that you know every burden of our heart, every place of pain. We thank you for the emotions that you give us. We even thank you for grief, for in it we know that we have experienced love deeply and profoundly. And we give you thanks for those people that we have loved and lost for those places that we have felt loss and for the transitions in our life that have created grief. Lord, we give you thanks for all of those places. We give you thanks for the goodness and we give you thanks for the heartbreak. For Lord, we know you are present in it all and that you go before us and behind us and that you surround us with your grace. All these things we pray and ask in your holy name. Amen. Would you please stand and sing with us? Still my soul, like a dove on 
undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. All now this stimulus shall be bright at last. souls to you and ask that you truly do still our souls in this week and day ahead, that you will surround us with your love and mercy, that you will journey with us along our path, and that you will remind us that we are never alone. All these things we pray and ask in your holy name. Amen. <laughs> 